Let's come before the Lord in prayer. O Lord our God, we bow before thee now, the author and finisher of our faith, the inspirer of the ancient prophets and apostles, through whom we have received thy word, the Holy Scriptures. Draw near to us now, we need thy presence with us to touch our hearts, to set our mind upon things above, to take from us every distracting care and burden and concern, and that we may feed upon thy word, help us to lose sight of one another, and may our affections be set on things above, and our desires be to know and serve and love the Lord Jesus Christ more than we ever have. We ask these things in his name. Amen. All thy ways to me. 429. instruction this evening to the book of Proverbs and we begin in chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son maketh a glad father but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Treasures of wisdom, of wickedness, profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, 
but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in time of harvest is a son that causeth shame. Blessings are upon the head of the just, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. The wise in heart will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. He that walketh uprightly walketh surely, but he that perverteth his ways shall be known. He that winketh with, his, with the eye causeth sorrow, but a prating fool shall fall. We turn secondly to chapter 12. We begin at verse 19. The lip of truth shall be established for ever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil, but to the counsellors of peace is joy. There is no evil happen, there shall no evil happen to the just, but the wicked shall be filled with mischief. Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. A prudent man concealeth knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. The righteous is more excellent than his neighbour, but the way of the wicked seduceth them. The slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting, but the substance of a diligent man is precious. In the way of righteousness is life, and in the pathway thereof there is no death. So reads God's precious word. May he bless it to our hearts this evening. Now let's join together in prayer. Once more, our loving and eternal Father in heaven, we bow in thy presence, knowing that we come into the presence of one <coughs> whose eyes see us as we really are. We read the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good, and that our lives are naked and opened to him with whom we have to do. Our thought life, our desires, our, uh, our intentions are all open before thy throne. We come as sinners, we confess our guilt, we look back upon our lives, how many there are things there are, Lord, of which we are now deeply ashamed, how often we thought ill of our God, how often we, in defiance and rebellion, were determined to follow the vanities of this world. But many of us here can also look back to that day, that season in our life when our hearts were touched and our thoughts were drawn to heaven and we sensed for the first time our deep sin and guilt and our need of the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour. We remember the time when we consciously turned away from sin and were anxious to live a life that was pleasing in thy sight. We remember the time when we 
that first saw the Saviour in all his sufficiency and saving worth and desired him as our friend and as our Redeemer. Lord, we renew our vows to him this evening. We look back in gratitude for what he did in our life and what he continues to do. We ask, Lord God, that each one of us here, especially those who at present cannot say that they have known thy touch and experienced thy converting grace. O oh Lord, may a time come when all of us can say, our God has done all things well. Heavenly Father, we draw near this evening grace to be given to us in our lives, grace to persevere in the Christian faith, grace to walk worthy of the God who has purchased us at great cost, grace to resist this world, grace to be fruitful in thy service, grace to be tender-hearted towards one another, forgiving and forbearing one another in love, grace that we may be a good witness to the Saviour by our life, and grace that we may have that strength that we need and the, uh, the ability to speak uh, of our Saviour and of the truth and of the gospel uh, to those that we come into contact with. Uh, grant to us gospel opportunities as individuals and give us that help that we need to point others to the Saviour. Keep us from hiding our light under a bushel. Uh, keep us from drawing back and not speaking the truth as we can and as we should. We ask, Lord, that we may be given gospel opportunities as a church here in this neighbourhood, that others may be brought under the sound of the gospel by our testimony. O oh Lord, work in the hearts of some in this town and in the surrounding towns and villages, that there may be a, a real hunger for the truth, a, a, a sense of the emptiness of this world brought into their heart, and that desire to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, perhaps there are some that feel empty and look upon this world and uh, see it's uh, the violence uh, and they see the misery that sin has caused and yet they do not know where to turn uh, and the way of peace they have not known. Lord, we pray that thou art in providence move the hearts of such that they may come and hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and find thy saving love. Do grant to us in our lives that grace that we need to mortify sin. O oh Lord, how often we act in sinful ways, by selfishness or by pride or by a love of earthly things. And we do not serve thee as we should. We pray for that help that we need, that we may uh, live godly lives that adorn the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do grant thy blessing upon every family that's represented amongst us here this evening. Uh, Lord, we commit to thee our children and grandchildren. Remember them for good. Sometimes we feel our inadequacy as parents and as grandparents to set before them a godly example. We feel inadequate sometimes to answer the searching questions that they ask, uh, to warn them against this world. And we pray uh, for that help that we need to be good parents uh, to our children. Lord, we pray above all that uh, do work in their heart at an early age. Uh, keep them from this present evil world. Call them by thy grace. Convict them of their sin. We pray for the teenagers and for the young men and young women. What pressure there is upon them to conform to this world. We know the natural uh, disposition of all our hearts and of the hearts of the young too is to rebel against the, the word of truth and follow uh, the broad way that leads to destruction. But Lord, in mercy, do remember them each and draw them to thyself and open their eyes to spiritual realities 
give to them a realization of the glory and the preciousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask, Lord, thy blessing too upon those who have professed faith amongst the young people, not only here but in the churches of this land. Uh, do keep them from the many temptations that they face and bring them to uh, grow in grace and to be uh, true, a, a new generation raised up to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ, pillars in the church, mothers in Israel, those who will be an influence for good upon uh, the rising generation in days to come. Lord, remember too that those uh, brothers and sisters that we know and love who suffer persecution and hardship. We pray for our friends in Ukraine and, and all the difficulties and uncertainties of life that they experience. Sanctify to them this time of warfare and trial and uncertainty that they may be close to the Saviour. And do bless those that remain there and grant them instrumentality that they may be able to point perhaps a, a fearful people uh, and those who have lost much in this world uh, to one who can more than satisfy their deepest needs. Grant many opportunities and bless the testimony of thy people in that land. We pray too for our friends in Sri Lanka. Uh, we realise that uh, with the collapse of their economy, there is much to fear and, and much to trouble thy people there but do appear for them in their need and bless them in these times and grant that their testimony may be a means, an instrument by which many shall be brought from the darkness of false religion to the marvellous light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless those that labour and preach the gospel in that land. Help them and strengthen them and grant them boldness and consistency of life and use them in a mighty way. We ask, Lord, for thy blessing upon us here too in all that we seek to do. Uh, we feel our weakness. We know that we do not have that power uh, to bring about uh, a, a change in one soul. And thus we look to thee for power uh, and for uh, the pouring out of thy Holy Spirit, uh, that the young in the Sunday school, that those that gather for our gospel services may be deeply affected and convicted and brought to the Saviour. We ask now, do bless us as we turn to thy word, prepare us to receive it, and do us good, that we may be strengthened in our convictions, built up in our faith, and that we may walk more closely and more earnestly with our Saviour, in whose name we ask all these things. Amen. We continue with him 257, 257. Awake, my soul, and rise amazed, and yonder see how hangs the mighty Saviour God upon a cursed tree. 257.
This evening to the book of Proverbs, chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. And our subject this evening is diligence or sloth in Christian things. Verse 4 He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. From chapter 10 in the book of Proverbs until the end of this book, we could say that we have the believer's handbook of life or a handbook for church members. How are we to live? Here is so much uh, compacted into such short, pithy statements which are of great value to the people of God. I remember some years ago, uh, Dr. J. Adams speaking on the book of Proverbs and he said, There are some parts of God's word that uh, are like chocolate. They just melt in your mouth and you can digest verse after verse. But he said Proverbs is more like a boiled sweet. You put one verse in and you suck it and you turn it over in your teeth and it continues to give flavour and insight and help to us in the Christian life. And I think there is some truth in that illustration. Well, here in verse 1, we are introduced to wisdom. A wise son maketh a glad father. Wisdom is skill for life or skill in life. But I want us to notice that in the book of Proverbs particularly, wisdom and righteousness are so often closely knit together. And so verse 2 speaks of righteousness delivereth from death, and the soul of the righteous in in verse 3. And as you go through this chapter and other chapters too, righteousness is an integral part of wisdom. In fact, the book begins by saying the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. And and so we cannot truly be wise unless we are concerned for righteousness. But what do we mean by righteousness? It means to be right with God and to be striving to live in a way that is pleasing to God. Is that our concern? If we are truly wise, then righteousness must be my chief priority. In verse 2, it's contrasted with earthly riches. And verse 3 speaks of the substance of the wicked, the things the wicked desire, tangible things. And these two verses remind us that To be righteous before God and to be walking righteously in the sight of God are of greater value than all the gains that we may get in this world, ill-gotten or otherwise. Verse 2 speaks of righteousness delivering from death, but the treasures of wickedness profiting nothing. Well, these things can only be viewed in this way in the light of eternity. What will it profit a man on his deathbed, whether he has 
a, a house that is large and luxurious or whether he's lived in a hovel. What will profit on that day is righteousness because it will deliver us not from physical death but from spiritual and eternal death. In fact, righteousness will deliver us ultimately from physical death because on that great day of resurrection, the righteous will be raised and given a body in the likeness of their saviour. Do we view things in this way? This is the beginning of wisdom, says Solomon here. The first thing he's going to say in verse 2 after announcing a wise son is pleasing to his father. A foolish son causes heaviness to his mother. Is how do you value things? Righteousness or earthly possessions? And he says there's only one thing, if we are wise, that we will truly esteem. Now in the book of this book, we are told these are the Proverbs of Solomon. A proverb is a parable. And so this book uses earthly illustrations or imagery, but ultimately it is intended to convey spiritual lessons. Now there are, if you like, earthly lessons here too. We're going to focus this evening particularly upon diligence. Well, it's true in an earthly sense, in a natural sense, a person who is diligent in their study at school will succeed. Someone who is slothful and doesn't revise, they will fail and there will be consequences. But actually, the parable here or the proverb is to be applied spiritually. The father in verse 1, ultimately, is a reference to God, our heavenly Father. And if we, as his children, walk in wisdom and righteousness, we will bring gladness to the heart of our God. But if we walk in slothfulness and folly, then we will bring, in a sense, at least in the terms of this parable, heaviness to the Lord. He will be disappointed in us as children. Now, of course, ultimately, we are saved by grace through Christ, and it's his righteousness which grants, gives to us our acceptance before God. But this is a book for practical living, and the, uh, and the, so the proverb is reminding us that it is through practical measures and heeding the wisdom of God's word, that not only do we gladden our Father in heaven, but we reap many benefits. So deliverance from death, verse 2, uh, um, the provision of our needs, verse 3. One old writer says, the Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish. He may, in his wisdom, allow some of his children to hunger and to know poverty, but they will never ultimately famish. They will never be left with no help and no support and no God. But I want to focus this evening then upon diligence in the Christian life. That's the message of this parable or these two pictures in verses 4 and 5. So what is meant here in verse 4 by a slack hand? He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. Well, this is the slothfulness word. But it actually has associated with it, and sometimes it is translated in this way, a deceitful hand. It's the picture of someone who is pretending, but they are not actually doing. Someone, perhaps a worker, who's pretending to work, and he's, he wants his master to think he's busy, 
but actually he's not doing much. That's dealing with a slack hand. Some have suggested the, the picture here is of a son working for his father in his field or in his vineyard. Uh, and he, uh, his father, uh, who is observing from a distance, he gives him the impression that he's uh, doing as he should be, but actually he's pretending. That's the picture here. And there is, of course, a challenge for us. The picture is, well, what of us? When it comes to spiritual things and our spiritual father, are we dealing with a slack hand? Are we living a pretended Christian life? We may deceive other people by our talk and by our habit, but the Lord will inspect our work, as it were, far more closely. And the proverb is a warning. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. So are we talking as earnest Christians? Do we go through the habit of a Christian life, but we forget that the Lord's eye sees our heart? And he will see when we are dealing and in pretense. Other people may think we are very careful and earnest in our Christian walk and life, but the Lord sees all the detail. He will be like that father that when the, the servant or the son has gone home for the night, will take a walk down to the field and see how much weeding was done and see how much seeding and planting was achieved. We cannot fool our God and it will lead to our spiritual impoverishment. And so what do we think, what is the application here as such then? Well, are we diligent in the use of those means which the Lord has given to us as Christians? Are we drawing from the wells of salvation? Are we seeking to study the scriptures that we may become well grounded, rooted and grounded in Christ? Are we prayerfully meditating upon these things? Do we seek to engage when we gather for worship, not only to hear what is preached, but then to reflect upon it and apply it to our lives? We read that uh, the diligent man roasts what he caught in hunting. And I've heard that applied to going to church. Not that you come to church to hunt, but we receive food, spiritual food, but that food needs to be taken away and digested and made use of. Are we taking notes? We don't have to, and it's some people can make many, many mental notes and they prefer to sit and absorb what is taught and they will carry all the points home in their, in their mind. Others find it easier to take notes, but the point is this, are we diligent? Are we seeking to absorb and reflect and confess any shortcomings in our life before the Lord? and seek his grace to walk more closely with him? Are we dealing with a slack hand when it comes to separation from the world? We might give the impression that we are uh, godly people, and yet when we are away from the gaze of men, we may forget that we are still under the eye of the Lord. We watch things, we go places, that are really very grieving to the Holy Spirit and unhelpful to progress in our Christian life. But we don't seem to bother. That's dealing with a slack hand. Are we planning day by day to be of great good to others, seeking opportunities to minister to them, 
uh, to advance the cause of Christ where we have opportunity? Or are we like a door swinging on our hinges, not really making any progress? This verse says, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. If we aren't serious and earnest and careful and diligent in the way that we live our Christian lives, then ultimately we will become spiritually poor. We will lose that conviction that once we had. We will lose that sense of God's presence. These things are so important. But look at the second half of this verse. But the hand of the diligent maketh rich. If we are diligent in the use of all the means of grace and all the opportunities we have, then it will be enriching. We will grow in knowledge, in discernment, in fruitfulness towards others. They will come to us. Notice here in verse 11, it speaks of the mouth of a righteous man being a well of life. The rich, uh, the, the, the righteous man is one and the same here with a diligent person. Someone who has diligently studied the word of God, diligently attended the house of God and sought to absorb and retain with the help of the Lord all those lessons and doctrines, that person then will be like a well of life. They will be a source of, of wealth, not only to themselves, but to others. In witness, are we rich, useful to the Lord in witness because we have been diligent in the use of means? Charles Bridges, a famous commentary on Proverbs says this, the Lord gives his blessing as he gives the fruits of the earth, not to them that wish, but to those that labor. The diligent servant is honored with an increase in his grace. And what he means is this, if you've got a garden and you wish to have all those lovely rows of vegetables that uh, you see on Gardener's World, you say, I wish my garden looked like that. Well, there's only one way. You have to diligently cultivate it. You have to plan, you have to plant, you have to water, you have to weed, and then you will have that rich harvest. And so it is when it comes to spiritual things. We have to cultivate the field of our soul. We have to glean in the field of God's word. And if we're diligent in these things, then it will be a spiritually enriching experience. It will impart grace and godliness and wisdom and righteousness to our life. Then look at the next verse. This is a parallel proverb. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. Well, that's true on a merely natural level as well. And I'm sure we, particularly those of us who are involved in farming, we can imagine the picture here. Imagine a, a, a father uh, and his fields are, uh, are, are white unto harvest, but his son is not interested. Sleeping, or the sense here is not physically sleeping, but idle. He's got better things to do. And so he's not applying himself. He's not willing to go forth into that harvest field. It's the season of opportunity. And so the picture here is a picture of diligence in the hour of opportunity. How discouraging to a father when those crops go waste because his son has been sleeping, when the ears fall off, where the storms come and, and the harvest is spoiled. And in a spiritual sense, if we idle away 
our time and fritter it away on other things instead of using the opportunities uh, to gather in a rich harvest for our souls, then what a tragedy. How disheartening to our heavenly Father. You know, in the English language, we have such abundant resources of spiritual literature. Most pastors I speak to would say that they wish their people read more. How many of you take good Christian magazines and read them? How many of you have a Christian book on the go? Perhaps two. And you resolve to read profitable material regularly. Or do we just say, oh, I'd rather sleep. I'd rather just be spoon fed. I give my time to going on the internet or other things. We need to be so alert that the picture here is of using those great opportunities that we have and the benefits will flow just as verse 4 tells us. In John chapter 4 we read that the Lord said to his disciples, Behold, the fields Lift up your eyes and look. The fields are white unto harvest. The Lord there is giving us a key to this verse, isn't he? Understand that it's speaking of a spiritual harvest. There are souls to be gathered in. There is a great work to be done. In natural things, if we were to view a field of wheat ready for harvest that someone has planted... And we've been asked to reap and we do not do that reaping. Then how disheartening is the picture. But what of those that have been sown to spiritually? Do we seek to reap the harvest? Those that come to the gospel service, they hear the gospel preached. Do we seek to put in that sickle after the service and speak to them? Engage with them, ask them, did they understand the message? Did it touch a chord in their own heart? We can encourage, we can be, as it were, fellow labourers in that harvesting work. Of course, the Lord is the ultimate power to bring about conversion, but he uses instruments. He might use you or me. Our words may be the means of conviction or awakening or even drawing someone and encouraging them in repentance and faith. We consider the great needs of the lost. It, that's what the Lord was urging his disciples to do when they were in uh, near that well in Sychar. The natural disposition of those disciples was, well, we're in Samaria. Our Jewish background tells us these are not people that we immediately relate to. And they were surprised that the Lord was speaking to that woman of Samaria. But the Lord says, look, they may be Samaritans. They haven't got that understanding of, of Judaism that you have. They're not familiar with the pure worship of God that you strive after, but they have souls and they can be brought to faith and repentance. And so the Lord, in a sense, is saying to us, are we concerned for the lost in Bulldog and Ashwell and Bygrave and Radwell and Letchworth and Stevenage and so on? There's a work to be done. Are we going to be like this parable those that sleep in time of harvest? Or are we ready to, to engage? However that may be, harvest work may be hard work. We may feel weary, but we know the work is rewarding work and joyful work. And so it is when it comes to spiritual labour. Bridges applies this verse in another way as well, he says, consider the personal harvest 
that is to be gained by diligence. Think of the invitations of Christ, the exhortations of God's word, the promises that he has laid down in his word. Are we going to harvest them for our souls that they may profit? Are we going to look into the the, the field of his word where it gives to us such instruction and make it our own? And he adds, the Sabbath is the golden gathering time of the week. It draws us aside from the world and beams with peace and joy and hope of heaven. Now, am I diligently improving this harvest? Well, the Puritans would say that the, the, the Sabbath or the Lord's Day is the market day of the soul. Bridges would say you can also see it as the harvest time of the soul. If we sleep on the Lord's Day, not necessarily physically, but we switch off and idle away our time, and we do not use those precious hours that the Lord has called us to set aside from all the distractions of this life and feed our souls and strengthen our faith, then we are like the sun that causes shame here in verse 5. But I want to move on to chapter 12 because there is another parable here that speaks of diligence. We can't possibly look at all of the verses that speak of diligence, but here is another one. Chapter 12, verse 24. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Diligence, slothfulness, the one set against another. Well, what's the picture here? The diligent will command a position of rulership, whereas those that are slothful will end up inevitably in a position of subservience. Now, of course, the application here isn't to a selfish ruling over others. That's not the intention of the parable. But it's to encourage us in a particular way. The word diligent here, it means, it's associated with a word meaning sharp or a sharp thrashing instrument. And if we could bring that picture up today, we could say it speaks of a machine, a farm machine that is ready for use. It's been diligently prepared during the off season. The bearings have been checked. Everything's been greased. The knives have been sharpened. It's ready to go forth into action. But of course, it's a picture of a person, someone who has prepared themselves so that they are ready to use all the means available to become equipped in the service of Christ. And it begs a question, are we such a person? Are we ready to engage in activity for the Lord because we are a person who is well prepared for service? How prepared would you be for that Jehovah's Witness that knocks on your door? A lost soul who doesn't know the gospel of Jesus Christ with the clarity that you know. Do you know how to answer them? What about that Roman Catholic who assumes that they are on the way to heaven? Can you challenge them? Can you answer them from the word of God? What about that person that's grown up under the grip of a rel another false religion? An atheist, perhaps. Can we challenge that person? The diligent is someone who says there are great opportunities for harvest, great opportunities to labor for the Lord, but I need to be prepared. I will diligently do the groundwork. I will study the scriptures. I will pray that the Lord would give me light and understanding. 
I will furnish myself from all those available means that the Lord has provided uh, through his servants over the years and under the preaching ministry today so that when those opportunities come, I will be in a position to command and influence. That's really what it means here. The diligent shall bear rule. They will command and influence. Happens in, in, in natural things, doesn't it? You put three or four people on a building site and two of them are slothful. They don't really want to be there. They do the bare minimum. Somebody else, by contrast, they want to see what's needed. They uh, quickly learn the, the, the technique and before long they are progressing. Who's going to command the influence? Who's going to become the site foreman? Who's going to be entrusted by uh, the, 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 the owner of the site? It's obvious, isn't it? And the picture here is that's what happens in spiritual things. Not such that we lord it over others, but we will become the most useful to the Lord in his building work, in his harvest field. The diligent will also, will, will always end up in that picture with that, with, with that role. And so it's an encouragement to us in spiritual things. What about in our households, in our families? You who are, you are the heads of the home, are you diligent? This verse is saying, in doing all you can to equip yourself so that when your children become teenagers and they ask those challenging questions, you can draw on that bank of knowledge and wisdom that you have. And with the help of God, you can confound the, uh, the, the, the influence of this unbelieving world. That's the, that's the position here. Not that you bear rule as such over your family, but your arguments win the day with the blessing of God. The opposite here, the slothful shall be under tribute, subservient to others. Someone who is not really diligent in acquiring that understanding of Christian teaching and seeking to walk out that Christian teaching day by day, they're always going to need someone to help their, hold their hand, to tell them what to do, to put them right. In that sense, they will be subservient to others who will have to lead them. The picture goes on perhaps a little bit more. The worst is that we become slaves to our own lusts. The slothful shall be under tribute. Not necessarily taxing here, but we become slaves to our sins, to our lusts. But if we are diligent in prayer, diligent in using all those opportunities the Lord gives us in the means of grace, then it will liberate us. We won't become enslaved to this world or to our old sinful habits and lusts. That's the picture. Well, time is almost gone. I wanted to look at two more, but really we only have time for one, and that very briefly. Chapter 13 and verse 4. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Bridges says, the sluggard desires the gain of diligence without the diligence that gains. Let that be a challenge to us this evening. Are we amongst those, well, we desire to be Christians. We desire God's blessing in our life. We desire that deep spiritual knowledge of Christ and his word and his truth. It requires diligence. If we just do nothing, we just drift through our life as a Christian without 
earnest, studious application to the ways the Lord has set before us. We'll desire all we like, but it will gain us no real benefit. But those that are diligent shall be made fat. Do you desire salvation? You say, oh, well, when it comes to salvation, you preach that it's all of grace. It's God work, God's work. He's got to change my heart. He's got to give me light and understanding and faith. He's got to give me that power to overcome sin. It's all of him. Yes, but at the same time, the scripture exhorts us to be diligent. Proverbs chapter 4, sorry, chapter 2 and verse 4. Solomon says regarding wisdom, If thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Yes, the Lord must give, and the Lord does give, but he gives it to those that seek earnestly. If we are not truly seeking with earnest prayer and using the word of God, that the scriptures that are able to make us wise unto salvation, then this verse tells us we shall have nothing. The way to hell is paved with good desires and good intentions. Do you desire sanctification? As a Christian, you say, well, I know that I fall into sin so often. We all do, don't we? But the path of blessing is through diligence. Diligent self-examination, <coughs> diligent meditation, diligent prayer, diligent use of all the means of grace. Well, there's so much more that could be said. But here is a handbook for church membership for every child of God. And one of the key themes that comes up in so many of these chapters is are we diligent or are we slothful? We can be diligent in earthly things. We can be most earnest in work, in business, in uh, looking after our family, in keeping our house tidy, but that doesn't make us diligent in the use of the things of God. And the important thing is, am I diligent there? Do I give it proper time and attention? Do I apply myself like a diligent workman working in his father's vineyard? Or may the Lord stir our hearts that this may be the spirit in which we seek to pursue the Christian life. Let's pray together. Lord our God, we thank thee for thy word, even when it stirs us up and touches perhaps a raw nerve in our lives. We confess how often we become slothful and negligent of all the privileges that we have. Forgive us when we fail. Oh Lord, do work in us by the power of thy spirit that we may be amongst those who know their God and know the truth and walk in it. We ask these things in the Saviour's precious name. Amen. Our closing hymn is 461. Lord, in the fullness of my might, I would for thee be strong. Make thy glad, glad service my delight, thy glory all my song. I would not give the world my heart and then profess thy love. I would not see my strength depart and then thy service prove. 461.
do grant that we may carry home in our hearts something from thy word. May we meditate upon it, digest its truth, apply it in our lives, and grant that we may know the enriching but uh, blessing that it brings in days ahead. We ask in the name of our Saviour and for his sake. Amen. <laughs>